Howdy! This lecture is for the course INST 222. It comes from our text, Diversity Consciousness. The topic is Personal and Social Barriers to Success. Upon completion of this chapter, you will be able to complete the following learning outcomes, beginning with differentiating between personal and social barriers to the final bullet assessing various strategies for overcoming diversity barriers. Our objective is for all of you to be able to identify and analyze the six personal and social barriers to success, and we'll do that via lecture and group discussion with 100% comprehension. The six personal and social barriers we will discuss are listed here on the screen. Now, Richard Butcher, the author of our text, he asks, how do we explain why some people are more successful than others? And he concludes by sharing with us that there are sometimes personal as well as social barriers that get in the way of some people being successful while others are not. Richard Butcher defines personal barriers as those individual factors that get in the way of our success. Our focus is on factors that relate to diversity. These barriers include one's lack of awareness, lack of self-discipline, cultural ignorance, and underdeveloped diversity consciousness. Personal barriers can also include a person's biases and discriminatory behaviors. Social barriers focus more on society. They refer to those factors that are external to the person and impede his or her success. Among these barriers are the perceptions, thoughts, and actions of others, ethnocentrism, stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination are barriers that can be personal and or social depending on the situation. So let's move on to the first barrier. Barrier number one, Richard Butcher defines as perceptions. And so in our text, Richard Butcher defines perceptions as the way in which we receive and interpret information from any of our senses. And for me, it's one of those intangible bits of our culture, you know, the, the way in which we interact with the world around us, it's very powerful and yet we can't see it, but it's going on um, regardless of that fact. Richard Butcher tells us that so often we have what he calls selective perception. And he says this occurs because we often perceive what we want to perceive. And, and we can only see things that are agreeable to who we are. And he says that a small fraction of the world is available to us because we have what's called these cultural blinders and they distort our perceptions. So take, for example, the image on the right of your screen. For some people, they will see a young woman. Other people will see an elderly woman. It's all based on your perception. And there may be some of us who will see both women. But Butcher is telling us that we need to be mindful of the way in which we perceive the world because often we're only allowing a small fraction to get through to us and not being able to take the world into our worldview in its totality will cause us to miss out on some very important opportunities for ourselves and for others. And these limited perceptions will often lead us to judge other people un unsoundly, of course. There's this African proverb that the author shares with us, and, and that proverb reads, when you judge others, you do not define them, you define yourself. And the point is, is that our perception of others really is a reflection of who we are ourselves. It tells people, probably without us knowing, that we haven't done our homework, we haven't taken the time to remove those blinders to get to know the totality 
of who other people may be. The next barrier to success, Richard Butcher defines as ethnocentrism. And he refers to this word as the assumption that our thinking and acting is naturally superior to others. So those of us who believe in this kind of cultural superiority are ethnocentric in our ways. Let's take a look at this Pew Global Attitude Project. There's some data here on your screen. So this question was asked of several respondents from many different countries. And they were asked, or, or said, it, it was said to them, and they were asked to sort of agree or disagree with this statement. Our people are not perfect, but our culture is superior to others. So when you take a look at the bar graph on the screen, you'll see that in Sweden, for example, only 21% of the respondents agreed to that statement. Now, also take a look at other countries like Canada and the United States, where 52% and 55% respectively agreed with the statement that our culture is superior to others. Now, every person in every country has a bit of ethnocentrism in them, but we have to ask ourselves, can ethnocentrism be an obstacle or is it something that we can be proud of? Does it have its benefits or does it have its drawbacks as well? Just something to think about. As we look on at another ethnocentric example, we take a look at two types of maps. At the top of the screen is what's known as a Mercator map, and at the bottom of the screen is a Robinson map. And the differences are clear. You'll see that certain continents have bigger uh, geographic spaces than others, different sort of ratios, if you will, um, to other continents. You'll even notice on the bottom map, the Robinson map, that the entire continent of Antarctica is absolutely missing. So there's a bigger point here, and the point usually goes back to the ethnocentrism of the map makers. You know, for example, those who were creating the Mercator map probably deem places like parts of Asia and parts of Europe as having more prominence uh, than places like the continent of Africa. And you'll see that the scale for which these continents are drawn are quite different. You'll also notice that Antarctica is not even seen or visible on that map. And that has huge implications for sort of the overall dominance of these countries uh, based on those who were creating these maps. Um, so the, again, this is another example of how ethnocentrism can get in the way of how people interpret the world around them. The third barrier, personal and social barrier to success, is what Butcher calls stereotypes. And he defines a stereotype as an unverified and oversimplified generalization about an entire group of people. And what he warns us is the fact that even though some of us who stereotype, we fail to understand that there are people who are aware that they are being stereotyped against. And that when this occurs, this phenomenon known as stereotype vulnerability can occur. So what is this? So when people stereotype us, we may feel vulnerable in our self-esteem and our motivation, if you will, may suffer. Now, those of us who are in the business of educating and motivating learners, we have to be aware of the huge implication of stereotyping and what that may have to the, on the K through 12 learner. So often we assume that that one size fits all. For example, if I hear that all poor people behave a certain way, Every time I interact with a poor person, I'm going to see them a person a certain way or, or interact with them a certain way. I assume that each and every person that occupies that particular cultural group must behave that way. 
And that can be dangerous because we all know that there are these generalizations that don't actually apply to every member of a cultural group. The fourth personal and social barrier to success is what Butcher calls prejudice, and he defines it as an irrational and inflexible opinion formed on the basis of limited and insufficient knowledge. So we have to ask ourselves, are, do we become sort of irrational in our thinking about certain cultural groups? Are we uncomfortable around certain people? Do we judge other people because of the way that they look, they dress and speak? Do we form an opinion about a person because he or she belongs to a particular group? And this often happens, this prejudice, because we don't have enough information. We rarely share in our schools, for example, an opportunity for learners to learn about other groups so that that prejudice can be mitigated. And we don't seize an opportunity to share about the culture of others. That's why having discussions or taking a course or being involved in diversity training or education, it's so important because you can dispel a lot of this irrational and unfounded information that comes from nothing more than stereotyping over the years. We have to be careful. So what happens when prejudice leads to an inaccurate judgment about other people? And it becomes a source of distraction to the point where it, where folks are feeling threatened or, or go through some kind of psychological harm. What happens when prejudice results in resentment and fear? And we see that with uh, xenophobia today when we have marches with folks who are against immigration and immigration policies. Is, is that brought about because of an irrational fear, because of a prejudice? We have to understand that those who hold on to that irrational fear, their health is suffering as well as those who are being uh, prejudiced against. We need to be aware of that. And this can result in what's known as coping fatigue. It's dangerous for all parties involved. So the fifth barrier to personal, the fifth barrier, of personal or social barrier to success is what Richard Butcher calls prejudice plus power. To understand this particular barrier, you have to understand what he means by power. So in our text, Richard Butcher refers to the ability to influence others and bring about change as power. Therefore, people with power are in a position to affect many more people by virtue of their prejudices. So imagine that you are looking for a highly competitive job and no one in upper level management considers you a serious candidate because of your gender, class, or ethnic background. Prejudice of this nature is more potent because it is backed by economic power. This is particularly true if you encounter this kind of thinking everywhere you go. So I hope the message here is about individual versus institutional kinds of prejudices. And so we often don't feel that my particular prejudice against a particular cultural group does anyone any harm. But when you belong to a particular power group, and you happen to have the ability to hire or fire or bring people into your organization, you now are setting up a lack of opportunity for the people who belong to that cultural group. And that's why we say that discrimination happens on an institutional level. That's why we say that this is sort of the lead up, if you will, to what we know as marginalization. We know that entire groups of people, whether it's persons with disabilities or whether it's women or whether it's people who speak English as a second language, they suffer from opportunities because they have been systematically excluded because of prejudices that people in positions of power may hold. And if that prejudice is exercised time and time again, we eventually see that that particular group becomes marginalized. We can look at certain institutions, whether it's our places of worship, whether it's a school or educational setting, or whether it's politics. When people who are in power don't see folks from underserved communities 
as valuable or have the ability to participate in that organization and they limit their opportunity. This is what we call systematic or systemic or institutional forms of discrimination that happen on the base of geography or able or ability or class or, or ethnicity. So it can be very dangerous because it can lead into something that can be disastrous for, for many types of cultural groups. Take for example um, the racial divide that's going on with the Trayvon Martin case. And whether we know it or not, often how we feel about particular groups um, is part of how a, a particular culture may think, feel, or behave. So two groups, whites and blacks, were asked a couple of questions. And their reactions are very different. So the first question was, do you think blacks and other minorities receive equal treatment as whites in the criminal justice system? Almost half of our white brothers and sisters said, yes, they receive equal treatment. But only 10% of blacks in this country from a Washington Post ABC News poll said we receive equal treatment. That is a striking difference. On the question of how much of a factor was racial bias in the events that led up to the shooting of Trayvon and the shooting itself, 27% of whites said it was not a factor. 30% of whites said it was a major factor. When you ask blacks the same question, 72% said that race, racial bias was a major factor. Now, each group may point at the other and say, you are incorrect, but we cannot turn our heads and act as if different cultural groups have different perceptions about race and race relationships in this country. And this is why so often our conversations always go back to a discussion on race because cultural groups, their perceptions are quite different. The sixth personal or social barrier to success, according to Butcher, is discrimination. And Butcher says that discrimination is defined as the denial of equal rights and opportunities to individuals and groups. Unequal treatment of this nature varies because of race, age, gender, social class, religion, or any number of other dimensions of diversity. So if you take a look, for example, at Table 3, dot one in our text and on our screen, you'll see that there are different combinations of prejudice and discrimination. You know, there is the prejudice discriminator, right? Someone who has a certain attitude and commits certain behavior. That's why both of those columns are checked. There are prejudice non-discriminators. These are people who have a certain attitude, but they've never had an opportunity to discriminate against a person. Then there's the unprejudiced discriminator. These are people who are part of a system that don't necessarily have a particular attitude about a cultural group, but they find themselves discriminating because of the position that they're in. They're being unconscious, if you will. And then there's the unprejudiced non-discriminator. This is who I hope we all plan to be. This is someone who has healthy attitudes about other people and they don't participate in discrimination. And when they do see it going on, they name it and they do something about it. What Butcher tells us is that discrimination comes in two forms. It can be very blatant in your face and it can be very subtle as well. And so often we may not even realize that we are participating. It can be individual whereby it's one person acting in an organization or an in, in, institution within the institution or it can be institutional discrimination. That means that it happens over and over and over again within an institution that it leads up to limiting whole groups of people from participating inside 
of a particular organization. And that's when it becomes truly dangerous. There's also called intragroup versus intergroup discrimination. This is when people in an intergroup within the group discriminate against each other. And then there's intergroup discrimination. That is discrimination between two different cultural groups. So if you take a look at our text and on the screen, the question was asked, who agrees with this statement? Blacks face discrimination almost always frequently when they rent an apartment, apply for a job, or eat at a restaurant. Over and over again, you see that blacks say that they do face discrimination. You see that whites, by and large, don't necessarily agree with that statement. And you see that our Hispanic brothers and sisters um, agree with that statement almost half as much as blacks who were asked this question. So what does this tell you? That your idea sometime of discrimination has a lot to do with your experiences. So if you've never faced discrimination or if you've faced it on a limited um, basis, then you may not feel as if discrimination exists for other people. So it's worth a conversation with people who are different from yourself. Now, the author tells us that we need to be aware of this idea known as pyramiding. So take a look at your text so that you can find the definition to this term and uh, you will be asked to reflect on it in a prior, in a, in a subsequent assignment. So regardless of the fact that pyramiding occurs, and we know that over time people's idea of being successful and what it takes and the energy it takes to be successful, uh, it can drain you. And over time, uh, one feels as if you are depleted, you feel unmotivated, and that's what our author is referring to by the pyramiding effect. So he's telling us that we need to find ways to go around these barriers, these personal and social barriers. And he gives us a list of strategies that we can employ. And one sh strategy is just to recognize that these barriers do exist. And not just for people of color or people who belong to marginalized groups, but also to people who belong to dominant non-marginalized groups as well. It's important that they understand that these barriers exist for other cultural groups because sometimes they can act as advocates to support these cultural groups. But also on the last bullet, and you can take a look at these strategies on your own, but the last bullet says we need to combat our own ignorance and intolerance. So that means just doing some self-monitoring, reflecting on who you are as a person and your personal biases. Can you be a, a person with biases and still be successful in your in your job or career absolutely but that only comes when you have taken the time to do a kind of inventory if you will on who you are and the biases that you may have as well so that you can work extra hard to um, overcome all of those biases there are several case studies mentioned at the end of our text Please take a look and review those case studies. Our objective was met today. We did identify and analyze the six personal and social barriers. And I hope you found this chapter helpful in, in determining who you are as a person and taking a look at those issues and barriers that can get in the way of success for yourself, but also for people around you. Thanks for your time and giggle.